uh, as you remember, on 8th March, it was uh, uh, International Women's Day. In four of that, then RDB uh, organized this special event. Without taking much of your time, I would like to request our CTO, Michaela Rugizangoga, to come in front and give us uh, the opening remarks. Welcome. You are home, but welcome again. Um, as we gather here today to celebrate Women History Month, uh, I am honored on behalf of the leadership of RDB to welcome every one of you to this special moment. This month, we do not only celebrate the achievements and the contributions of women throughout history, but we also reflect on the progress we've made and the challenges that we have ahead of us. The theme for today's discussion is sharing journeys, shaping careers, and it resonates deeply with us as young professional, as Rwandan professional in this journey of developing Rwanda. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from extraordinary women professional, each with their own unique story of perseverance, resilience, and success. We have Nadia Keza, who is the chairperson of RTTA. Please, well, round of applause. We have Madame Alice Nulinkinha, who is a board member of RDB and the CEO of BPN. Please. And we have our very own Madame Rosette Rugamba, former Chief Tourism Officer at RDB, uh, and who is today the owner of Songa Africa and uh, other, other entities. As we embark on this journey of reflection and inspiration, I encourage each one of you to listen with an open heart and an open mind. Let us celebrate the achievement of women leaders, learn from the experience, and draw inspiration from their stories as we continue to shape our own career and create a more inclusive world for us all. Thank you and enjoy this moment. Thank you, CTO, for the opening remarks and uh, just uh, giving us some good words just to open our minds. Um, in short, we are going to have the elect, uh, the, the, uh, I'm going to call the panelists just to come in front. And uh, as CTO said, I'm going to, uh, I think all of us are going to enjoy the discussion. Uh, I'm Claudine from the tourism department, product development analyst. Our today's session is a very interesting session with our panel. You see, um, it's full of experience, inspirational, and many ideas to lead us through the growth and sustainable development. So, um, we have um, this session in two uh, different uh, groups. With session number one will give us opportunity to hear from our panelists and uh, also have a time for question and answer. Then the second session will also be with uh, another bunch of questions, one question per panelist, and we will again give you uh, an open door to ask questions, ideas, and share your thoughts. So um, this uh, event is all about building our capacity, learning from the team, and uh, we really encourage all of you to actively participate and share your thoughts. So uh, uh, if you allow, we can start with our first bunch of questions. And we start with Madame Nadia Keza. Feli has introduced her, but I just want to emphasize that she has a very good experience in leading the tourism industry. So any idea or any question in related to tourism, 
Feel free to express yourself. If you are thinking about investing in a tourism or have a, a business in tourism, ask questions and you'll get support. So, Madam Nadia, if you allow, the first question. Um, your journey in the travel industry has been truly inspiring, marked by significant leadership role and contribution to the sector. Can you share a pivot moment or challenge you encountered during your career, as well as how you overcome to it a continuous and a driving positive change and innovation? The floor is yours. Um, I'm very happy to be here. It's really a great honor to be sitting here and to share my story. Uh, where do I start? I came uh, from Canada in, in 2004. I was coming from, um, uh, from Montreal and I had a um, university degree in biochemistry. Then I arrived here, freshly arrived in Rwanda and I had uh, also a family business uh, running. It was a travel agency. But it was doing very bad. They were about to close. Then, uh, at the same time, I was applying and uh, I had a promising job um, in uh, Rwanda um, uh, RB, uh, Standard, Bureau of Standard, KIST and KIE, because I also have a master in education. So, I had a choice to make. Uh, or to go and accept the job, or to support the family business, which was dying. There's no money there. So it was a tough decision, and I was, uh, it was not easy, but I decided to support the family business. And I went home, and I told my husband, from now on, consider me as jobless, because I'm taking a tough job, and I will not have anything to support in at home. So you, you need to work double. So he was very supportive, and he accepted, saying, no, it's okay, try. If it doesn't work, you, you still have a chance to, to close it and um, accept the job. Uh, so it was tough uh, with uh, two staff, which are, I was coming with Canada with some expectation in customer service, and it was not there. I had to think twice, what do I do? I have to start from fresh, so I have to learn. I was uh, really uh, comfortable in booking tickets. In, uh, we, are, we are Ayata already. We have stock of tickets. Uh, the staff I, I need to hire, but not too much because I didn't have money to hire staff. So I need to do it myself. I was having a different hat. I was a salesperson. I was the marketing person, the accountant, the manager, everything. And I was having babies at the same time, so you can see the mess. I was working 24-7, but I have an objective. I say I have to succeed. I have to, to become one of the best travel agents in the country. So I have a plan. I have a vision. And for that, I needed to hire people who, who share the same vision as me. Uh, I got a very good staff uh, in 2005, and uh, we were together for a year. And I trained her, I really, um, she, she had the culture of the, the company, where we want to go, where we want to reach. Uh, unfortunately, after a year, my competitor pushed her, so she took her. After all the work done, uh, I was down again and uh, I put all the hearts again and work hard and to make sure that the client we had already keep being satisfied, so I have to work hard. Uh, so day after days, we, we got uh, staff, we got clients, we keep growing slowly and surely. Uh, and that, um, that's where I realized when, when you have a challenge, you, you think it's, uh, it's tough, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity to grow. So it's where you realize how, how people are the, the most important assets. In, in my company, they're the one giving the service. The, so we are in service. So people is the most important asset. So before even really taking care of the clients and everything, it started from home. 
from my staff. Are they happy? Is the environment very good? Why do they have to leave? So I need to work that. If I have good staff, they have to stay. Uh, so I train them. If anytime there is a training, they have to go for the training. Um, we do a coach, a coaching one-on-one. -on -one. When there's something doesn't going well, I make sure we um, we sit together and we we, tr we find a solution to a problem. Uh, we we create a good environment. We, we do some retreats, uh, some trainings, uh, all together, and. Um, so they, they, they feel they feel they are part of uh, of the company, and any decision is taken, we put on the table, we discuss, we find solution together. Um, so that that was um, a good way and a good challenge uh, we got with staff. Uh, but I really thank God uh, from we we were two and now we are thirteen. We are thirteen, and uh, ten of them we have we are together for more than ten years. So it's a uh, good uh, achievement. So, and um, also, we, uh, I can uh, attest that for before COVID, uh, we, had, we had a chance to, to, to win awards for three consecutive years for being the leading travel agency of the, in the country. And uh, we, all of that. So when you talk about COVID, COVID was another challenge. We, we closed for eight months, March to August, and, uh, but uh, I kept all my staff, and I was keeping paying them, thanks to the saving we have made. We, we learned a lot from COVID, how important it is to save, uh, and um, it was a good lesson, and we, um, we overcome uh, all the challenges uh, with COVID and uh, we keep growing, uh, we keep, um, I keep engaging the staff, uh, we do uh, what we call our Friday corners, every Friday we have to meet and we discuss how was the week, all the challenges we have got, it's the time we discuss, we innovate, we, uh, we find solution to any, uh, any problem we, we, we may have, um, so that was um, really, uh, I, I, I can say I have um, participative leadership. My staff are very important in making decisions in uh, everything we do. So we have grown. We don't do only tickets. We, um, we are in tourism. We, uh, we do tourism in Rwanda, and we also we do packages for people who want to go all over the world. We have all the contracts uh, uh, with, um, with the hotels, sightseeing, and we are part of BCD, which is good. BCD is a brand which is all over the world. So it's good to be part, uh, really, of a um, professional network. We do meetings, we sit together, we, we overcome all the challenges we have in, in our industry, and uh, we, um, we use the latest technology available in the market. It's because of that connection. We, it's, uh, so we are where we are because we got all that supportive uh, system. And uh, also to being part of a network, a uh, professional network, I'm part of uh, BPN. Thanks, Alice, uh, for all the training you keep giving us. And so it's good to grow and to arrive at a certain stage, you say, okay, I'm good. But it's very tough to stay there, very. So, <laughs> so you, you need to keep learning. It's, uh, you can never say, I have arrived. You can never say that because learning, it's a process and uh, you keep improving, you, you keep innovating. Um, so in conclusion, what I can say, um, I'm, I'm very proud of the choice I've made and uh, it was tough, but uh, I can say every day we are confronted in uh, making choices. And I think the toughest choices are the most uh, rewarding. So keep that in mind. Don't take shortcuts. And uh, also, um, I advise you to always be part of a um, uh, community, always uh, be part of a network, always be part of a good and positive cycle. It's very important. 
when you're always with people which are negative, always complaining, mm. leave that cycle. Then yes. you not go far. And um, also, I'll always have my four Ps. You have to plan. You have to progress. People are the most important thing. And you have to pray. Thank you. Thank you very much for the good experience. From myself, I just picked some remaining positive focus, determined in whatever you are doing, and have a vision. She couldn't be where she is today if there is no vision. So from that, we are going to our second panelist, Madam Alice. Alice is an entrepreneur, very skilled woman, ready to, to work and uh, meet new realities in her business. And today she's going to share with us her experience uh, through the question I'm uh, going to share with her. Uh, your career trajectory has taken you across multiple countries and sectors, from banking in renowned Swiss firms to your current role as a country director of BPN Rwanda. So can you share a defining moment of experience from your international journey that has shaped your leadership approach and contributed to your success in a driving business development and economic growth in Rwanda. Thank you. The floor is yours. It's a huge pleasure for me to be here. I'm not a guest here. <laughs> I'm part of ADB and uh, I'm really grateful and honored to be part of the team. Um, before I share and uh, I answer the question, I would like to invite you to something. As we are seated here, I would like to invite us to not make this an entertainment or a conversation. I invite everyone, everybody to think of a minimum of one thing that you, want, you are going to change following the conversations that are taking place today. Minimum one. Yes, and so coming back to your question, um, well, uh, defining moment, uh, yeah, my first reaction would be like Nadia's. Uh, I think it's difficult to find one moment. A lifetime uh, consists of several milestones um, that are pivotal and that take you in a specific direction. Um, so I allowed myself to pick three moments. Yeah, thank you. I would like to start with um, the amazing opportunity that I had of studying computer science in Germany. Uh, and uh, that opportunity, <laughs> Michaela knows exactly what it means. <laughs> um, though I studied there a few years before you, quite a number of years before, at a time where Africans were rare in Europe, and at the time where I, did, I went there to study computer science, there were, we were 100 students, only three women, and one was from Iran, myself, and all the rest were Germans, Germans, French, Europeans. And, um, but I will not, uh, there's, there will be a lot to tell about that experience. The only thing I wanted to mention is that we, I had that opportunity together with my sister Christine, that probably many of you know, Ambassador Christine, yeah. and we had that opportunity because our father allowed us to do that. Our father believed that there is an opportunity in studying, and uh, so our late father did not let people convince him that you can't let your girls go in the world and learn and make the experience. I'm saying that because we are talking about gender, we are talking about women empowerment, 
and I'm glad we have many men in the rooms, so you really have a role to play with your daughters. And you have an opportunity to shape uh, the future by allowing your daughters to fly. Um, the second pivotal moment I would like to mention is, um, so after my studies, I started working in Switzerland. And um, so I was working in a leading firm that was serving uh, banks. And at that time, I was a, a software developer. So I started as a software engineer, young graduate, and I was surrounded by experienced, very experienced people and men only. I was the only girl. I was in my 20s. And I remember a moment where we had uh, an escalating project and we were in a boardroom discussing about the project. And all the men were discussing and, and positioning and, and I was sitting there at some point and I'm like, oh, maybe you should say something. I guess you know those moments where you feel like, oh, they'll think I'm stupid because I'm not saying anything, but am I going to say the right thing? I'm just myself. So I shied away, but I took time to listen. And then, so I took time to listen, listen, and I started drawing and what I was um, hearing. And so it was a quite controversial discussion and everybody was kind of, I realized that everybody was kind of to defend their own position. And at some point I stood up and I went to the board and I draw what I was understanding. So the different, what was the input, the output, the, the dependencies, everybody was quiet in the room like now. They were looking at me, this young girl, and everybody said, but exactly, this is what I was saying. Exactly, people who were fighting, everybody said, exactly this is what I was saying. And that changed everything. From that moment on, my career started um, uh, evolving. But for myself, in that moment, what I realized is that it's important to be authentic, to be uh, faithful to yourself, to bringing other people forward. So I was looking for something that will bring the whole room forward. And from that moment, uh, I grew from my position as a software engineer to becoming the team lead, and uh, later on, uh, the head of department, and it went on, um, on until uh, I had the opportunity to represent the organization in Singapore, and uh, running two projects in Singapore and Hong Kong, and yes. And um, during that time, so that's my third pivotal moment, uh, Rwanda was talking about Vision 2020. And I was traveling all over the world constantly. I was living more on the plane than in my home and uh, hearing Vision 2020 and I was, it didn't leave me at peace. I started wondering what is my contribution to that. And I kind of started feeling like a disconnect between the life I was living and the life that my country was trying to uh, to build. So I started opening my eyes and I started feeling a void in that international, highly competitive environment. And at some point in an event like this, uh, the founder of BPN presented. Um, he, used to, he presented, it was in a management retreat and I had never heard of BPN. There were many, many organizations that were presenting and when he explained that what they do is business development, high quality, focusing on high potential, focusing on the person, not on the skills or on the technical technicalities, and to bring economies forward, offering a holistic approach, I was, it blew my mind away. I was like, this is exactly the solution that our country needs. So I, I approached him at the time, and, of, uh, and uh, after his presentation, I ran after him, and I'm like, you need to come to Rwanda. I had no idea what I was talking about, but I told him, you need to come to Rwanda. Rwanda needs you. And he's like, mm, with a history, and mm. so I pick his business card, and I constantly followed up. Uh, he, they did not really highly, they were not highly interested. So I went to, the, to our embassy, 
our late Ambassador Sebudandi was in Geneva at the time, and I told her, there's a Swiss program and it's going to, it can change Rwanda's economy. We need to talk to them. And she said, okay, let's get an audience. We got an audience, they listened to her, and they said, um, we, uh, we are giving you a delegation. We see that you really mean it. They gave us a delegation, we came, we had a lot of support from, at that time I think it was uh, Riepa, it wasn't ADB yet. We got a lot of support, uh, we met His Excellency, and he confirmed to them, he said, I believe in this approach, and you're very welcome to our country. And when we went back, so they started looking for budget, I went back to my job in Singapore and Hong Kong, and at some point they called me, they said, we have the budget, we would like to go to Rwanda. How can you help us? And suddenly I was puzzled because I didn't know what to do. <laughs> and I started having sleepless nights. I promised these people I have my career. At that time I was not really thinking of, it was not very clear to me how I could come home. I had uh, my son, I was expecting, I was uh, uh, pregnant. My husband is not Rwandan. So, um, so at some point, he is the one, my husband, who said, you know, you've been running after these people for years. Who says A says B? Let's pack and go. So I called them, <laughs> and I called them, and I told them we, we would like, uh, I think I found someone for you, and who is it? Um, oh, we didn't dare to ask you, really? Uh, because we saw that you have a career, you have a life here. Uh, are you sure you want to, to leave everything behind? We said, yes, we thought of it. We know it's not like it's a, a, an NGO. It's not like the private sector. You don't have the same privileges, the same high salaries or whatever. But um, we said, God provides, we're going to do it. And that's how I came back here. And um, I'm very grateful for that decision because it made a huge difference in my life, and it made me re uh, switch from career to calling and to serving. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Alice, for this great experience, inspirational, and um, leading us somehow to think about um, how to listen to your inner and to define exactly where you can contribute and how you can contribute to make your society more attractive and reach the objective, the global objective of the country. So this is what myself, I picked from your presentation and inspires me. So we are going to the third question. And the third panelist, Madame Rosette. Rosetta have a, a golden experience in tourism, both local and international, where she even advised the, the, the international tourism organization leadership. So her experience is not just Rwanda, it's tourism in Africa community development, cultural, hospitality, and uh, tourism. So allow me, Madame Rosé, to welcome you with uh, my question. Your journey in the tourism industry has been marked by numerous achievements and significant contributions, particularly in Rwanda's post-genocide era. Can you share a transformative moment or project that challenged conventional thinking or approaches in the tourism sector? And how did it shape your perspective on the industry's potential for driving economic growth and fostering cultural exchange in Africa. Thank you. It's a bit emotional for me to, to come back here to tell you 
what you all know and what you really contributed uh, towards. Um, but I thank you for the invitation. Uh, where can I start? I think uh, the challenges are, were so many, transformational were many, uh, but I will, I will start, maybe I'll skip a bit what you already know because most of it you did it yourselves, many of the faces that I'm seeing here, but I'll talk about uh, a little bit about my background and what really uh, led to, to the phase that uh, I got into in 2002. Uh, just like my colleagues have said, it's, it's amazing to have uh, parents who, who really uh, grow you with the confidence. The confidence you have got and, and the confidence that they gave us was with nothing. Uh, so the generation today, it's a different mindset. And, and that is, uh, I'm on the sixth, gener uh, sixth floor, so I can confidently <laughs> tell you, uh, for those who are maybe from the half, <laughs> half my sixth floor, uh, uh, that the, the thinking is completely different. And, and that's, that's really, uh, it creates a base. And even for those who are not thinking the way we were thinking, the way our parents are thinking, you're going to be bringing up children who are going to be the, the next generation. So that's very important into what you become after. Uh, I was, uh, uh, contrary to my two scientists sitting here, I'm a social scientist, I'm an arts person. And, and that was, uh, I, was, I never ever thought of, of science, but I, I, I had a clarity of vision. In my life, I've always had a clarity of vision, whether it is small, whether it is big, but that clarity has to always be there. Uh, I'd always wanted to be a diplomat. And in our generation, you either had to study, we had very few. <laughs> you either did BCom or you did became a lawyer or you became a doctor. Uh, the, ch the choices were very limited. So my only way to become a diplomat was to study social sciences. And then I chose international law and international relations in order to become a diplomat. Uh, then along the way, I studied a bit of German, French, and English because I felt that we needed to have uh, those selections. Um, tourism wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't a job. It wasn't a job. But if I roll back now, how did I end up in tourism? I think when I finished my primary seven, I told my, my father that uh, because I've done so well, I want to make a journey to Kenya on my own. And I was very, very young. So I went on a bus on Akamba and went to Nairobi. And, and I think that is where the passion starts. And you don't know. You think it's an adventure but then it eventually leads to what it is today. Uh, later on, as life goes it, I, I finished studying, uh, I was still waiting to be a diplomat, and then I had to go to London, and uh, that's where I got married with my husband, and uh, I remember I looked for different jobs, but the jobs were not clicking. And because we are here to talk about careers, we are talking about women, uh, they set up career entities to tell people what, that is not always right. You have to keep searching and trying to see where is the passion. And if you're ever lucky where passion blends with, a, with something that will pay you, that is the best uh, advice in terms of career. So I uh, worked in Harrods. Harrods is uh, very, very one of the best it's, it's a leading, it's one of the best, uh, uh, what is it? <laughs> it it's, it's, it's like a shop, it's a mall, it's, it's a shop, it's, it's, it's one of the best in the world, a department store. Uh, but that went to show that what my parents taught me to say you dare, because when you're in the UK, you are told, do lower jobs. You didn't study this. 
you can't even go to work in that departmental store if you don't show that you have been in another departmental store. But I was determined. And I said, no, I want the best. Because my parents taught me to always go for the best. Uh, I went and got interviewed. Uh, I got the job. Uh, I served people like Princess Diana, all the royalty. There is no celebrity I didn't serve. And then eventually, I was picked up among the first people who went to open their first ever duty-free shop in Terminal 3 in London. And that, again, gave me something to say, I'm still searching, but at least I am among the first people of Harrods to open their first duty-free shop. And that, for me, was climbing the ladder. So always look for things that will lead you to climbing a ladder. So when I'm there, I'm seeing people traveling. But remember that we're in the UK. To get a security pass to enter into Airside, the vetting that you go through is just unbelievable. So that was also something else. I was there for two years. And uh, in 1994, when all this was happening in Rwanda and, and, and what have you, I, there was a new thing that was happening in, uh, in Europe, the Eurostar. I don't know if you've heard of the Eurostar, the Channel Tunnel Train. And uh, again, I was among the first 100 people that started the Eurostar. Um, so that was unbelievable. It was a new discovery. It was exciting what they gave us, and uh, it's a company that you worked where they dressed you from the shoe, the socks, the, it was, you had an American Express credit card, you were given a, a loan for a car, it, it, it was unbelievable, but also it was fundamental. You are going to go in a train where you're going under sea to go to Europe. Uh, so for me, that was really, really exciting, and I remember one event when we were opening, uh, the queen was coming to open, and uh, the, the, the day before, we, we had to take the press, or it was that day that we were taking the press, and uh, the train refused to start. So whatever challenge you get, it happens everywhere. We had planned, we had prepared, you can't believe how much preparations we had done. The queen is arriving, I'm among the people receiving the queen, and the train did not stop. And guess what? Today at home, I have a whole newspaper cutting where I am in the picture saying uh, customer services manager uh, at the inauspicious launch of the Eurostar. So that was my first headline newspaper cutting. What would have been the best day? It is now you are in the headlines as the inauspicious launch. Um, but it was done. It was still unexciting. We learned a lot that we competed with airlines to actually say, go to the Eurostar because it's from city to city. You don't have to go through the airport two hours and what have you. So that taught me another angle of what you can market. And that was 1996. And uh, my husband decided that it was now time to go back to his home country from Uganda and, and just decided we're moving back to Africa. And I said, you're joking. You know, I've got a good job. We've got a home. We've got our two children. One of them is Matthew Rugamba, Henrietta Rugamba. And everything is going so well. And you're wondering why. I, I was so upset with my husband. Uh, you've just got a mortgage, you've got everything, and things are okay. So why? Why are you going now? Um, so just we let him, I let him go, and then the, the, the children went, uh, and then I got an opportunity of uh, British Airways. Uh, I was actually headhunted. Uh, British Airways Head of Sales and Marketing for Uganda and Central Africa. That was amazing. <laughs> I, 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 it's amazing to come back to Africa on a high note. And I remember uh, when you're in Europe 
and you're traveling to Africa, we, you have to come back with gifts, you are traveling in economy, you learn how to balance both your luggage because you have excess luggage and, and what have you. And now, I was only traveling first class. I had to do a dress code, how to be a corporate, everything that I had always seen people do and I never knew that I would actually do them. And now I'm doing them and coming back to Africa. Now, what is funny is that when uh, the first attraction for me for the job was that they were giving me a mobile phone, and those days the mobile phones were this big. <laughs> and I said, even if you don't pay me and I get that mobile, so it was this big, and that was the excitement because there were very few people with mobile phones. So uh, that journey was so good. It was so good. Um, uh, I did a lot of marketing. I, uh, as much as I studied strategic marketing in the UK, but that was just an academic paper. I think what you actually learn along through all this is really uh, bless yourself, congratulate yourself for being here because what you're learning every day is more than what you can ever learn in a classroom. I, I, I was able to come and try to market here uh, and in, uh, in, in Uganda, uh, the, the loyalty programs, uh, I took clients on Concord, uh, anything that you can ever imagine. So you, uh, my husband had a fantastic job, we are all doing okay, and then guess what? In 2002, I come for my brother's wedding in Rwanda, and I'm excited about organizing an event of Rwanda, and before I went back on my way back, I was told, what are you doing? <laughs> Why aren't you coming back to work for your country? And uh, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> uh, because I felt that everything in Rwanda was very good. <laughs> they actually didn't need, they didn't need me. Uh, I can never stop being grateful to His Excellency. Uh, anybody who is working in Rwanda, you are so blessed because you are allowed to think, you are allowed to test, whereas in other places, you are given everything and when you are put somewhere else, that's why you can't perform, because you have not tested. Um, in British Airways, I had Bupa, I, for medical, for shopping I'd, on the weekend, I would go Friday, go to London and then come back. So there were many, many challenges along the way. Uh, I remember I went to climb uh, to see the gorillas at seven months pregnant because I wanted to see. Those who are here know that the first ITB, the minister refused to sign until I go. I went to ITB at eight and a half months pregnant because if I didn't go, the entire team wasn't going to go. I went. I was admitted in hospital. The rest is, is, is history. The board actually gave me a board member to escort me so that uh, if anything happens. But that is sheer determination and resilience. I went, we worked, we did so well. We came back and straight away I went to deliver. So the, the, the story of Ortepen is, is, I can't even tell you how, one of the first things I had to do was to to restructure the whole organization. And restructuring meant telling everyone to go home. I sat through the interviews of almost 3,000 people. We would start in the morning and finish at night. Uh, and yet, but why was all this important? Because our generation, I felt that People post-genocide, people fought the liberation struggle. Our role was the economic liberation struggle. So, so we need, every generation need to see itself. That yes, we applaud those who laid the foundation and did the, econo the, the liberation struggle, but there is also the economic struggle and we were lucky to have a visionary president. When I came in I was told we have to generate a hundred million <laughs> by 2010 
And by that time, we didn't even have statistics, but what I remember was like 12 million, which we would just do out of pack statistics. And look at what it is today, 600 and something, because our president had a vision. The, uh, I'll skip and say some of the things which were transformational. I want to talk about Akagera National Park, my biggest headache. People were dying, fires, everything. We lost two thirds, but we had to keep that pack. We had to be creative, we had to be determined, but we had the leadership that was backing us. Uh, it, it was difficult to explain to people why you should keep a pack when people are dying every day. But we overcame. What you are enjoying today, that is where it started. So whatever sweat, whatever challenges you go through today, know that your children are going to benefit. I am benefiting in the private sector. I didn't know at that time what I was doing. Serena, you see today, intercontinental. I was chairperson of Prime Holdings. I had just joined. I've hardly set my foot on even correcting the, the, the tourism. And I'm told chairperson of, uh, of, Inter, of Inter, Serena, we call Intercontinental at that time, Prime Holdings, and we were given six months to build that hotel. We opened it on 12th February 2004. The president came almost every night to come and see what was happening. So what you see here is a lot of hard work it's a lot of, he had the vision. I did not become the chairperson because I was the best person. No, it is because he connects the vision and says, if we need a five-star hotel, the head of tourism is the one to actually do it. It's another story what we went through <laughs> to really get to what Serena is today. But I remember when we opened it, everyone said it was a white elephant. The World Bank and IMF themselves said we will never support because Rwanda doesn't need a five-star hotel. But our president and the leadership said, no, we need to put aside the social sectors and do the economic sectors. So we will need this five-star. And it's got to be linked with. <laughs> Another challenge is, was, uh, which was really uh, transformational is our first ever HIV conference, I don't know if you all remember. It was PEPFA, where again, um, our leadership went out in a conference and uh, uh, Djibouti, uh, no, it was, no, that was Serena, the, that Serena, well, that was, was something else, but uh, there was uh, a conference and they were supposed to host, another country was supposed to host it and, and then our leadership says, no, we can and we had 1,500 people in 2007. And our office became, I, was, I became the head of what RCB is doing. And it was in my office. That is again, but it's okay because now, look at RCB, it started there. Because, you know, the, 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 the transport was Minister of Transport. Uh, mayor's office was something else. The, the government worked as one cluster, and we divided. And the conference was exceptional. One story that I want, we went to Vision, Gachurido Vision, and we told everyone to give their, their house. And we told them to put in all the amenities, and that became a big accommodation area. So things possible. There was stops and those are reality. We just need to write books and get uh, uh, people know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but again, those things just didn't happen. The president and the leadership were constantly present. We only performed because we had backing. A lot of people can have clear visions and whatever, but if the leadership is not supporting you, you will not move. But they are also, that when they support you, also present results. 
And that is what we are trying to share today. Of course, my final one is Kwite Izina. I cannot finish without talking about uh, Kwitizina, which uh, again, the ownership goes to the bottom-up approach. It is owned by the rangers. It is something they had always done. The only thing we did was to make it public, to give it a different level, to make sure that we can. But even when you're going to do something, make sure you get the right backup. When the idea came, I went to the president and said, we have this great idea and we want your involvement. So in the process we lost a year, in 2004 we didn't name because we were still waiting and getting things right. And in 2005, the first gorilla naming ceremony where His Excellency and Madame named the ever, first ever surviving twins in the world. It, it, it was, uh, it, it's, it's for those who are not here, for those who, uh, there are things that are behind the scenes, every movie has a behind the scenes. I think one person should write what was happening, how we arrived and, uh, but what was even the thinking behind that? It was, we want that road to be worked on. The road was so bad going to see the gorillas, and yet every important guest went to see the gorillas. The community needed to get support. So it's, it's, it was, there was a lot of things we wanted to get. It was not just the naming, but it was also celebrating the success of a conservation success of an endangered species. But one thing that many people don't know, that I've not seen written anywhere, when, and I'm saying this because it's post-genocide, um, the, during the struggle, His Excellency and his team said, go and get all the computers of Karisoki and keep them. They kept them, and they told nobody to touch the gorillas. And when the war ended, they gave back to Karisoki their data. It is not written anywhere. Mm. So that is visionary, and we are all tasked to ensure that we fit in into that, and everybody has a role and a part to play. Uh, there are many. The first lodge in Nyungwe, it was from Octapen Mane. It is, we, we were determined. We are going to, since His Excellency showed us that we needed a five-star hotel in Kigali, we are also going to make sure that since Nyungwe has become a national park in 2005, we are going to make sure that there is a five-star hotel in Nyungwe. And that came from Octapen Mane, and we actually started the first, uh, and then we sold it to Dubai World uh, later. So again, those are things that uh, shows unconventional things, things that you can do from your office, and they make a difference, and they set the standard, because if that had not been done, by up to today we wouldn't have a five star in, in, in Nyungwe. Um, yeah, then I go to private sector, private sector, uh, again, there, I was a government person, no money, but very well equipped with a lot of knowledge, a lot of training, and knowing what tourism means. So I only started with a desk and a laptop. I went back to the drawing board. But what are things that help you as a person? Respect people along the way. Be good to people. Many of you here have helped me for who I am. People in the bank, I remember the first project that I did, the bank teller went and opened and gave me an account at 8 p.m. The first cars, driver guides all came and gave me free to drive the first tour. So you don't get where you are alone. There are people who take you along. And today, yes, Song Africa was opened in uh, 20, 2010, 16th of March. We're now 14 years old. Uh, and then it gave birth to Amakoro Songa Lodge. 
Amakoro Sangha Lodge was not something that I immediately felt that I was going to, to do, but I just got annoyed because every time when you're dealing with luxury people, they book very last minute. I would never get rooms. So I just went, not knowing even where I was going to get money from. So dare yourself. And now, but principles have to remain that you have to remember that because you've gone in the private sector, you don't forget what you did in the public sector. So I, it was important that one community is part of, of, of what we do. And from the beginning, we said 50% of the people who are going to work at Amakoro were going to be from the community. As we speak today, we are 67.5% of the people from that community. We, thank you. We currently have, together, we have uh, about uh, 60 staff members and uh, 31 are women and 29 are men and we also have people in the leadership, women not only doing the lower jobs but also taking on uh, senior positions. So um, I think I've gone too long. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I just wanted to bring in the, 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 the private sector role that, uh, of where we are and I give it back to you. Thank you, Madam Rosette for sharing the experience. I think this is inspiring as you know. You, you know exactly where you are heading because you have the history, you know where you are coming from. So thanks for sharing the experience. Uh, tourism can have so many negative effects. We could have all this money coming in, but there's something we call tourism leakage. And tourism leakage means you get a lot of people uh, selling packages here, but how much of that money stays in the country? And this is something that I know we are doing, but I think we need to do a bit more to ensure that we are really following on the vision of this country. There was a clarity when the tourism was being put it was really a key economic driver and a poverty reduction strategy. We must do itineraries that ensure that there's regional distribution of that tourism dollar. That when we are doing itineraries as tour sector, we do seven days so that that one gorilla permit manages to reach somebody in Kibuye, somebody in Nyungwe, and somebody in Nakagera. That is the vision that our president had. So we are letting him down. We need to not relax and say, report statistics saying we have 620 million. No, 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 trickle down and actually say how much of that is actually being lost. RCB, if you're talking about conferences and you're saying how one of the biggest problems we had initially when we started tourism was that what I didn't say, when we first opened Serena uh, Intercontinental, I walked in there one day and almost everything was being imported from Kenya. That was a tourism leakage. The coffee, the tea, the beef, and whatever, we need to look at that. To the extent that we learned that even the chips were being flown in from Brussels. So let's be mindful. I'm glad you've raised that question. We need to go to another level to assess how much of the tourism dollar is actually staying in the country and how much of the tours we are doing. There is that, there is sustainability, and many other things, because when you offer, and that's why Rwanda was very smart to position itself as a high-end ecotourism destination. That was a deliberate strategy. It was to protect what we have, but at the same time, raise revenue. Now, going back to your actual question of the community, it could have been worse, but it was thought of. That's why the revenue sharing is there. That's why I think actually on the government part they've done a lot. I think what we need, even everybody of us in the private sector, to really look at ourselves and how much is the private sector really translating that. I am trying to do it in Amakoro. Sometimes it's very difficult on the tour part. But what I love about going into hospitality, you're in control. 
and you can actually look and actually say, if I'm building a lodge at Amakoro, how many people are going to get jobs there? What facilities am I going to bring? And that, for me, became a conscious decision to actually say, what I did in government, I cannot go into private sector and forget it. And that's why the first thing that I did was create a women association, and it's called Abagore Kuisonga Mukubunga Bunga Ibidu Chichish. They are 22, and they actually work with us from day one that we started building. We've got a youth. They are the ones who entertain. It is 35, and we have a project for them. Our chef is from the local community, and we are very proud of that. Our massage lady, she's from the local community. She came, the first thing she did, she was carrying cement. Then she became a housekeeper. Now she's a massage lady. Those are the things that we need to track. Now for me, it is, it's a passion. It is what I, I, I celebrate. So, but the challenge becomes that when you are telling your team to do it, they don't understand why you're telling them to do it. So last year, I had to create a, a job of a community conservation post. Uh, now, the good thing about at, in the Virunga area, it's already working. They, you know, because of the revenue sharing, the porters are benefiting, you see what happened, the transformation has been big. But we need to see, is it the same in Kigali? Is it the same in, uh, in, in, uh, in a Kagera area? So uh, the, the, the challenges are there. We need to make sure that the, the, the money is trickling down to the people. And there are many ways of doing it. Uh, we are now, like for instance on our menu, we've removed things like smoked salmon. We've said, let's now look at, in the food chain, how can we use what we have? Uh, interior decor. Three quarters of Amakoro interior decor is from Rwanda. So it's, it's really us being mindful that the community will benefit, but that is where I'm pleading that that is the next journey that we need to make if we must count, and then let the statistics people go down to actually evaluating the actual trickle down and the real transformation uh, that, that tourism is, 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 is making. So we're on a good track. There's a lot more we need to do for, for, for the community, uh, especially those who are around the protected areas, but even the ones uh, in, the, in the city center. Uh, uh, maybe even those who are benefiting to who are having problems, we don't, we don't know because it's not well captured. Thank you, Madame Rosette, for, for that. Um, Today we had a very good experience. Uh, we learned a lot, and uh, I think this is contributing to personal life of everyone in this room. Uh, now let me just give uh, just like uh, one second or two seconds for every panelist to, to respond to what Candy uh, proposed, how to keep the memory yeah, of your experience. So what I wanted to say first to that question, uh, but before I answer to that question, maybe let me add one thing to confirm uh, and um, again appreciate what Rosette has just shared. Right now we, we, we were talking about tourism and hospitality, and, uh, but in fact and communities, and the same applies also uh, for the private se sector at large and for investment. Um, when we had uh, our FinTech forum last year. I don't know if some of you probably were there. When um, the chairman of uh, Kigali Financial Center said um, no so big investment or international investment will never work if you don't have locally fine functioning is, um, SMEs. And it's the same in the tourism sector. We need to you can't leave people behind and believe that those things will function in isolation. Yes, so um, coming back to your question, um, I love the question because it's something that before I used to shy away from the microphone. I, it was a huge stress for me too. And uh, I felt 
we need to share our stories, not because they are great, but because they inspire others, and because um, everything we do comes from somewhere. And we need to appreciate the journey to be able to build the future. Um, and yes, it's a question we cannot answer today, but I was thinking exactly the same when Rosette, Rosette was telling her story. Uh, Rosette, I think everybody knows you in the country, but what you shared with us is amazing and nobody knows that. Not so many people know that. So we need to find ways to, to, um, to keep those and, um, uh, and uh, uh, that's a question that has been in, on my mind. And I'm glad that I managed to convince the MasterCard Foundation that we are going to have a platform where uh, we keep and share stories of impressive women that can inspire others. It's always good, uh, whatever you are doing, whatever you, to look for, not for mentors, but kind of. There are people who are doing the same thing you do, and there are people who, who are already far, so why don't you learn from them? So we have to have that uh, curiosity, that always uh, look for, for those people, uh, look for those stories, look for, for that. Uh, if it, there's nothing in place, we have to, to do the step and uh, see people who, uh, who have done much in their lives. We have a lot to, to learn from them and uh, we approach them and we keep growing like that. Uh, thank you. Especially people like me, as I said, I've reached sixth floor, you're counting and you're saying, oh my goodness, uh, time is going. Uh, and, and so you're, you're busy trying to, to, to think, and it's only like when I'm sitting here that I start remembering certain things and, and then realizing that it's important. But um, now that I'm a grandmother, <laughs> it, it brings more responsibility. First of all, I have to slow down. <laughs> and then it, I have to make sure that uh, my granddaughter, Maya, will find inspiration and hear stories and grow in a world where they can read and know and maybe learn. So my passion is whatever I can give, hoping you will pass on and it will reach my granddaughter. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I agree that uh, we'll see what to do. We are today in the public sector. Maybe tomorrow we'll be in the private sector. Yeah? Share with them advice. How to move on. How to be like you. How to be your babies. Thank you. To have a, a vision and to have a goal. And yeah, for that goal, try to, to do all activities towards that goal. When you are doing something, say, is it really going to help me to reach my goal. If not, leave it. And uh, also, um, my advice is to really have the hurt of gratitude. Sometimes you complain, you complain, you complain, but yet you have many things to be grateful for. So be grateful, have that hurt, and uh, think big and plan and do uh, slowly, slowly, step by step, uh, and make sure you, you, you have a vision of doing something in your life and make it happen. You have to think big, but you have to work really, really hard. You, you, you have to be, work hard and be resilient uh, and just focus. I, I always focus on where I want to, to be. Now, the biggest problem is when you don't know where you need to be. So if you don't have that, then first work on that. Because otherwise, then everybody else will take you where they think you should be and you'll be totally uh, confused. And ultimately, I'm very spiritual. I don't do anything without uh, praying about it. And that is... Uh, uh, Chibeho is my regular visit, 
uh, even now before my granddaughter was born, I first went to Chiveho. And by the way, thank you so much. It's looking very good. <laughs> so uh, so it's, it's really uh, spiritual, have a clarity of vision, and then uh, pick one or two mentors. You know, who, 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 who inspires you? Uh, funny enough, sometimes it's not the big people. I look at my driver. We've been with my driver uh, 21 years. And he is, Emmanuel took the driving profession as, when we go places, they respect him before they, they give him a chair because he took it upon himself. He's a driver, he's got a house, he's got a car, he's well respected. So whatever you do, do it well. So I fully agree with uh, what my sisters have said. Uh, I would like to add one thing. Um, we are blessed to be in a country where a lot of things happen, a lot of good things happen, a lot of um, opportunities, a lot of changes, a lot of, we have a lot to look up to. We are well, um, we have a, a leadership that I think no other country in the world can, can uh, claim to have. And uh, for, the, for the young generation, what I would like to say is uh, always to be mindful that there is a difference between opportunity and opportunism. So be aware of that. Look out for opportunities, not opportunism. Opportunities to make a difference. Opportunities to add value wherever you are, it can be in, in, in your office, it can be in your community, uh, the community you live in, it can be whatever you do. Um, do it with a sense of making a difference, adding value to others, and um, yeah, being, always having a serving attitude that will take you places, that will open up other opportunities so you can uh, keep on growing. Let me thank you for a good interaction and thank our to our panelists we had a very attractive session educational inspirational and i do believe uh, every one of us has picked something to build a career and build a modern society a society where everyone is living in in peace and uh, Development. We are in development board, so I assure from this lesson, from their experience, we can freely move on and make our daily job, our daily life more attractive. So big applause to our panelists. Thank you so much. Another round of applause. We are almost at the end of our session, uh, but we, before, uh, before leaving the stage, uh, I have just one announcement. Uh, the ladies in the room, we are having some gifts for you. Don't go without taking a gift. And I request also CTO to come front and uh, offer the gifts to our panelists. Uh, the gentleman in the room next year will have a gift for you. <laughs> I think we need a round of applause for Claudine Rubagumia. It's her first time moderating a panel. And yes! <laughs> and she took, she took the challenge, she, she jumped on board, and well done, Claudine. My dear Claudine Omutoni, if you can come forth, and with Eve, you come together, and then we thank our panelists. <laughs>